Welcome. Here we are again with another Kit Plus TV magazine show. Stay where you are to find out what's coming up this week. Our workflow guests this week are Jake from CVP talking about the much anticipated A7S 3 from Sony and Steve from Hardsoft is here to discuss leasing options for your next hardware investment. We also have Stephen from TSL Products with considerations when investing in audio over IP technology and Richard from MediaKind updates us on their streaming solutions. And given the time of year when students are taking a well-deserved break, well deserved. Uh, we catch up with Alex, who is Faculty Technical Advisor for the School of Creative Technologies at the University of Portsmouth, with how they are preparing students for a life of virtual reality. And possibly one of our most popular segments on the show, which is becoming a little bit like Partridge in the Pear Tree List, is Alistair Chapman, who has so far demystified RAW, explained all we need to know about gamma curves, shown us how to set a tripod, weighed up ISO versus gain control, and shared his lockdown experiences on streaming. All of which you can, of course, watch on the previous uh, shows on the YouTube playlist. So let's find out what's coming up later in the show. And I'm going to be taking a look at the full frame look. Is it really a thing or is it just a myth? And don't forget, if you're short on time, then there are links in the description of the video to jump directly to any point of the show that particularly interests you. Let's go over to Dick and see who's with him today. Thanks, John. Today I'm going to be talking sustainability and green issues with Albert in the form of Rosé Canella from BAFTA. But for now, back to the studio. So we've been following the journeys of students from Portsmouth Uni in the Kitplus magazine for several years now, and more recently, of course, on this weekly show. So this week, we thought we'd pick up on the latest developments at the faculty, and in particular, a sizable investment in virtual reality. We're joined now by Faculty Technical Advisor Alex Council. Welcome to the show, Alex. Let's pick up on VR, as this is not something new to Portsmouth Uni, is it? No, um, ever since the sort of 90s at the university in our technology courses, when VR first made an appearance, it's played a big part in our games development courses and other areas, but we've seen a, a resurgence in the interest in the last year with Oculus and other headsets. And it's something we've adopted strongly across quite a few of our courses now. Uh, that's great, Alex. So what are the plans for the centre going forward? OK, well, um, we've always planned on opening like a dedicated centre to give access to, to a wide range of kind of cutting edge technologies. And just recently, we've been extremely um, lucky and successful in um, securing some funding from the Solent Local Enterprise Partnership um, through HM government money. And um, we've been awarded um, £3.6 million pounds, uh, to uh, buy and equip um, our new Centre for Immersive and Creative XR. So we're calling it CCI XR. Now, um, the XR in that stands for extended reality, um, because there's lots of terms out there now at the moment, like VR, AR, MR. And there's now a, no, a new umbrella term that's come out called XR, which covers kind of all of the above. So that's we've incorporated that into the into the centre name, yeah. So it's the the, the centre for creative and immersive XR or extended reality, um, and the university are putting some money towards that. So it's one point five million pounds investment from the university, three point six million pounds but from Solent Lep and the government. So that's a, a total investment of five point one million pounds um, for a new a new centre within the Eldon building and the faculty of CCI. So Alex, I appreciate this is early stages, but can you give us a, an idea on the sort of equipment that, and the technology you're going to be investing in? OK, yeah, we've based this on some of our areas of expertise that we've been developing within the university already and also looking at newer areas because the, the, the funding has allowed us to now look at technologies that we've not been able to afford before. So we're expanding on our, our motion capture studio provision to give more ability for a larger area to capture more subjects. We're also investing in a photogrammetry rig, which will allow us to do full body scans for actors um, and objects and scan them in to use them in kind of XR applications. We're also um, looking to purchase a volumetric video studio, 
So it's another way of acquiring content to show in XR applications. And then one of the key things we're bringing together with all of this is kind of a big VR development suite or XR development suite, where we'll have a very wide range of headset devices, input devices, and kind of haptic devices that give you feedback, force feedback from sort of virtual worlds and a numerous display technologies and a virtual production stage incorporating LED walls, tracked cameras, and kind of media server input to allow us to look at new ways of broadcasting to, for our film and television courses, and also the, the, the upsurge in virtual production over the, the, the last few years um, has driven us to sort of pursue aspects of that within our mocap studio and within our VR facilities. But now we're looking to bring all of that technology together to build a, 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 a production stage where we'll have LED wall technology and bring that all together. So it's, it's a wide range of input technologies and then a wide range of output technologies. How do you capture that content? And then how do you display that and interact with that in meaningful and different ways? Cool. And, and ultimately, um, the student experience, I mean, the, the aim obviously is to prepare students for work with the skills they need to get the best start in their chosen career. So in terms of VR, then how do you see the technology being used and developing in the industry and providing better chances for the students going through your doors? Well, we've seen lots of crossovers in the last few years of kind of skills permeating between and game engine technology has become so prevalent in, in virtual production. So now our, our animation students and our game students are being approached by a lot more industries who are requiring the skills in kind of engines such as Unity or Unreal Engine because they're using that for virtual production setups. So that's where we're seeing the crossover now. Lots of skills are bleeding between courses and allowing students to kind of pick and choose in, in, in industries they wouldn't normally work in. Um, and that's the really exciting part for us is our game students could look for jobs in film and VFX um, and our film and VFX students could look for games for jobs in games because games technology is becoming so much more powerful and there's not that such a wide gap between you know creating assets for one and the other. There's, they're coming together all the time. So yeah, that's the most exciting thing is I think all these different crossovers between these areas of technology. That's great, Alex. Thank you very much. We'll put a link up on screen now where people can find out everything that you do there at Portsmouth. Um, and hopefully, um, as the situation develops and uh, you come close to completing the, the school, um, we can pop down and have a look ourselves. That'd be great. Thanks, Alex. And of course, you can check out all the information on the School of Creative Technologies at University of Portsmouth on the link on screen now. If you're a uni or school with an interesting story to tell, then do get in touch and we'd love to share your news. So as you probably already know, Media Proxy is the global leader for all things compliance. With over 20 years in the business and over 15,000 channels deployed in over 60 countries, they are the trusted partner in the industry for logging, monitoring and analysis of linear, broadcast and OTT. What you may not know, though, is that LogServer features extensive tools around digital program insertion, detection, and monitoring. Support includes SCUTI 104, as well as Type 5 and 6 SCUTI 35 messages. Triggers can be monitored live, reviewed, and analyzed, as well as reconciled in real time against second screen events. And if you're looking to replace your Volucon system, team up with the global leader in compliance. Now, Dick Hobbs spoke with Media Proxy CEO a few weeks ago, and you can watch that on the link on screen now. And for more information, please check out their website. So now let's go back over to Dick and today's guest. I'm sure, like me, you've started noticing the logo that says Albert Sustainable Production at the end of some of the uh, popular programmes on television. I wanted to find out what it's all about, so I'm talking to the person that knows. I'm delighted to welcome Rosé Canella. Rosé, tell us your background, first of all. Why, why, why are you hello. here? Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so basically, my background comes, I used to work on TV production in Spain. I'm, I'm from Barcelona. So I... I there for around six, seven years on TV production. Then 10 years ago, 11 years ago, actually, I moved to England and I worked on production here as well. Uh, but then a few years after, I realized I didn't want to work on production anymore. And I did a degree on sustainability and environmental management. 
And then I found this absolutely amazing job that combines both of my careers. So I have the experience on production and the knowledge, and then obviously the knowledge on sustainability. Uh, so Albert, the project is part of, of BAFTA. Um, how did you find out about it? How did it? How did you get involved and how did it start? Um, it's quite funny my story because I found out through a Facebook group called uh, People Who Works on TV, People Who Works on TV. I'm sure lots of people use it to get a local crew, which is great for sustainability. Uh, and that's how I found the job. So when I joined the job uh, around, but Albert, around four years ago, um, it wasn't, we weren't that big actually, the team, we were two people for a while. And now we're going to go to be 12 people. Um, um, so it's quite a big thing. When did it start? So Albert start our consortium that we call it, I'll explain you know what it is. Uh, it's going to be 10 years uh, next year, so it's, it's nine years old. Uh, but the project started a little bit before uh, with the BBC. So the BBC decided uh, to create a carbon calculator to measure the impact of their own productions. Uh, so they were really successful with the calculator. They did the trial and it worked. So they wanted to give it to a world, like, like share it with the whole industry. But obviously, no, the whole industry will want to use something that is owned by the BBC. So that's when they decided to hand it to BAFTA because BAFTA is a charity, so has no commercial incentives uh, on the tool or the project. And it's kind of the house of everybody in the industry. So that's why they handed it to BAFTA. So BAFTA is the chair of the project, but actually the project is funded by our consortium members, which are the main broadcasters and production companies in the UK. I suppose the sensation is that, that being green is, a, is an imposition on businesses, um, that it's going to add complexity and it's going to add costs. Um, is that really the case? Or are there wins for production companies by looking at, at, at Albert? There is definitely wins, but obviously it depends who you talk to. They're going to say, okay, if I want to hire a hybrid car or electric car, it's going to cost me much more money. But then it's always about looking at the long term and from the beginning to end. And we know that productions, sometimes they're really short. Uh, but still, you can hire an electric car, which is going to cost you more money, but probably you're not going to have to spend money on petrol. So again, it's about the overall uh, costs and savings. Um, in terms also what we think is that because now is there is more demand for green and sustainable products and uh, the price is going down. So we just need to look at the example of LED lighting. So LED lighting 10 years ago, it was so expensive to hire. And now the price has gone down a lot. And the reason why is because there is more people demanding uh, for those services. And eventually... Uh, sustainability, so the UK government uh, has a legally binding target to be carbon neutral by 2050. So you want it or not, every industry in this country is going to have to be green and it's going to have to uh, apply sustainability measures. So it's much better if you integrate to your business right now into your production so to make sure that you become resilient to all that. Rosé and I carried on talking for some time. You can see the whole conversation by following the link here. But for now, back to the studio. First up is Caption produced with news from TSL Products, who are now offering a virtual training program for its Tallyman Advanced Broadcast Control System uh, to its customers around the globe. TSL's Tallyman brings complex systems under a single point of control and minimizes operational complexity, allowing staff to deliver high quality outputs with minimal risk of error. This virtual training course aims to ensure that users are armed with the knowledge to unlock the full capabilities of the control system. Blackmagic Design have announced yet another version of the A10 Mini Pro. This time the A10 Mini Pro ISO, a new low-cost live production switcher with a new five-stream recording engine that allows all video inputs to be recorded and the live production to be edited after the event. Users get a clean feed of all inputs and can use multicam features in their editing software for editing after the event. It also records all audio files, media pool graphics, and a DaVinci Resolve project file, so a live production can be opened and edited with a single click. A10 Mini Pro ISO is available immediately from Blackmagic Design resellers worldwide. 
This July saw Trams Limited, a leading value-added reseller in IT solutions for the media and entertainment industry, celebrate its 30th anniversary. Established in 1990, Trams is a well-respected and proven supplier with some big-name partners including Apple, Dell and Quantum, to name a few. We at Kit Plus would like to wish Trams a happy anniversary and wish you well for the next 30 years. And now our first workflow guest on the show today is Jake Ratcliffe from CVP. Welcome to the show again. How are you guys doing? You all right? Yeah, very good. Thank you. So after the recent announcement of the A7S III from Sony, we've been waiting a long time for it to happen, and, and now it's here. Can you confirm it was worth waiting for? Absolutely. I sold mine back in, I think, I think it's like 20, 2018, and I've been waiting ever since. <laughs> So yeah, it's nice yeah. to finally have it here, and yeah, Sony haven't uh, haven't pulled any punches with it. It's, it's, it, the specs look really, really good, and I've ha I've had some hands cool. on with it, and it is it's an awesome, awesome little camera. And the images are good. Yeah, the the unit we had uh, had some limitations; we couldn't shoot any uh, test footage. Um, but I think we should be getting a full production unit so we can actually shoot some stuff because there is a bunch of footage floating around online, and there's some beautiful stuff already out there, um, which is yeah, great to see. Yeah, look so cool. in terms of features then, Jake, can you, can you go through the things we need to know, frame rates, low light, abilities, and so on? Yeah, I mean, so Sony have taken the same approach as the previous uh, Alpha 7S cameras. So uh, they've built a 12 megapixel sensor, which is brand new, um, which is supposed to be massively improved over the original, uh, over the, sorry, the A7S Mark II. So you've got more dynamic range in theory. You've got lower uh, rolling shutter, so better rolling shutter performance. It's, um, it's got color matching with the FX9 and the Venice, which is one massive thing that I think wow, people have yeah. slightly glossed over a little bit was, you know, the A7S2 people used to rip into it a lot because of its color science. Um, and that's one thing they've improved a lot of the FX9. So it's really nice to see that they've uh, worked very closely. The, the, the lower end Alpha series cameras and the more cine guys, they've worked very closely on this camera to kind of bring the uh, color science closer, which is great to see. Um, and other than that, obviously, yeah, you can do 4K 120, full sensor readout, no pixel binning, no line skip, skipping with full massively improved autofocus. It's, it's pretty much just what everybody's been asking for for the past you know, three years since the, since the last one. So yeah, it's, it's crazy what they've managed to, to jam into the camera. Um, it, it does sound amazing and I'm uh, a user of one myself, but there has been another obviously um, large release from a, uh, a competitor, that'd be the Canon R5. Um, how do the two compare? I mean, is, what, what are the big differences? Is there room for having two of them in your kit bag, perhaps? <laughs> um, two in the kit bag, I mean, if you're, a, if you're a hybrid shooter and you want two cameras, one for stills, one for video, I could see that. Um, but for video, I think they're two different tools, really. Um, the A7S II is yeah. really, really aimed at that video side of uh, you know, video shooters, whereas the R5 is going to be one of the you know, best hybrids on the market. You know, it's still an amazing stills camera uh, with video features put in there as kind of an afterthought, even though obviously 8K is is interesting. How many of us are actually going to shoot it and utilize it to its fullest? Not many. I'd rather take damn it range and, you know, a better looking image over more resolution. So it just depends on the end user, to be honest. It's a price. It's the price a bit of a surprise because I, I, I don't know whether it was, you know, it's quite a lot of money, the, the, the S3 that is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the the camera market's changed over the past few years. Obviously, it's it's a lot more than the S two was introduced at, um, but it mm. is around the same price as most of these other kind of you know flagship mirrorless cameras that Panasonic, Canon, yeah. you know, have, have introduced. So obviously, looking at like the S one H and the R five, it's around that kind of same price point. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of understand it. I do wish it was a little bit cheaper, and I know some people do, mm. but. Yeah, I could imagine, you know, as as these cameras do over the next year, they'll, they'll depreciate a little bit and stuff will come down. So, but for people who want to jump uh, straight in, they'll be able to make their money back easy with these cam with this camera. I mean, considering the specs, it, yeah, and the image quality you're getting out of it, yeah, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna please your clients with it. <laughs> and as an entry starting point, is there a kit? Is there a sorry, Simon? Is there a, is there a, a kit package or is it body only and then get the other lenses? Yeah, so it's it's body only at the moment. They they are doing a uh, pre order deal where you get three hundred pounds off of uh, I think it's like twelve different uh, lenses, and you get a three year warranty as well. Um, so that's like a it's quite a nice thing because there's obviously tons of E mount lenses now, and Sony's some really really nice ones. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And when can we expect to see it in stock on the CVP site, uh, Jake? So yeah, pre-orders are open now. Um, and if you do want to get it early, I would suggest doing that because there will be a lot on pre-order. <laughs> um, in terms mm. of actual stocking, they're supposed to be shipping in September. So that's hopefully when we'll start getting our stock. That's great. Thank you very much Brilliant. indeed. Jake, we'll put a link up on the screen now where people can keep an eye on the site to uh, to check on the stock levels and, as you say, to pre-order now. Thanks very much for coming on Kit Plus TV once again. Thank you, guys. Cheers. And in Manipulate and Edit News, audio post-production facility PIP Studios has announced that it's now fully open, offering Dolby Atmos capability from its six purpose-built Atmos stages on its site in Winnish, Berkshire co-founded by leading industry figures Ali Curran, Mark Sheffield and Nigel Bennett, PIP offers state-of-the-art audio localization services for feature films, television, gaming and streaming. And it's that time of year we have more from Blackmagic Design now. It's been revealed that DaVinci Resolve Studio was used for end-to-end post-production on Elton John's performance of I'm Still Standing for the One World Together at Home global broadcast and digital special to support frontline healthcare workers and the WHO. With more than 2 million views on YouTube alone, the entire project was completed by a team of four people in just 20 hours. Uh, Los Angeles-based live entertainment and media company Detune has chosen Grass Valley's recently launched DV AMP cloud-based software as a service platform to support completely virtual live event broadcasts. The team first deployed GV's agile media processing platform to help creative agency public school successfully and quickly pivot the corporate theatre style events it runs for its clients to the virtual world. And Karen Higo have announced that its virtual placement technology is being used by Interregional Sports Group, ISG, to place virtual graphics into live broadcasts of Liga Serie A football matches. Using space in empty stands and other areas on and around the pitch to display team branding, sponsors' logos and promotions, ISG is enabling leagues, clubs and content owners to open up new revenue streams. And now let's welcome our next guest, Steve Hill from Hardsoft. Welcome to the show, Steve. Now, you are known for selling and leasing computer hardware. Have you noticed a shift in interest towards leasing computer hardware since the COVID-19 situation started? Uh, yeah, I think beforehand, we started to see a shift before COVID. Um, and then after COVID, a lot of people are trying to get their mobile working solutions and working from home solutions updated. You know, their, their computer at home might not be the most up to date. And then, you know, all of a sudden they're forced to be working on it all the time. So we've had a, a number of people uh, contact us about updating their home solutions uh, and also people that don't have, you know, the laptops, the the, the mobile storage or, or whatever it may be that they need to be working from their current situation, whether that be at home, whether that be in the shed, whether that be uh, in a cafe now that, now that they're open again. But, um, you know, with offices shut and uh, people reluctant to go into offices, uh, definitely people have been updating a few things and, and leasing because of obviously the, the, the cash flow benefits and the benefits there um, has, has we've seen a little shift towards us in terms of uh, what we're getting. And the other thing as well is that people, as I say, with the lower spec stuff, realise their stuff at home might not be so uh, uh, well spec. So actually they're going for a higher spec now to protect them from that in the future sort of thing. Hmm. Now, Steve, I'm hoping this next question has got a positive answer, but uh, you know, there's many businesses that have been economically impacted during COVID-19 situation. How, how has it sort of been for Hardsoft over, over this period? Yeah, I think March and April, as with everybody, it was a confusing time. No one really knew what was going on. That included us, our lease companies, and a lot of our customers as well. But I think that was true of most industries and uh, most people. Uh, since then, uh, we've kind of returned to where we were before. Um, we've pivoted a little bit in terms of what we offer. So we've got our traditional flexi lease, which is what, what we've been known for over the last 20 years or so. But we've also uh, improved our pure rental offering, which is a literally rent it, hand it back at the end. Uh, we managed to bring on a couple of funders in the downtime um, that can offer us better better residuals on that. So the pricing's come down a lot. So that's 
proving quite popular. Um, we also offering a new two year lease called Flexi 12, which is a shorter commitment for customers. Um, committing to three years before COVID was fairly easy conversation. Now, not so much. You know, everyone's looking after cash flow and making sure they're not committing their, themselves too far ahead. Um, and Flexi 12 has helped with that. And we're also offering um, some refurbished stock as well on our pre love range. Um, which has just launched as well. So we haven't got massive amounts of stock of that, but that's something that we're starting to, to grow and build as well to our customers. Most of our customers, um, we, you know, being in leasing, most of our customers have actually fared okay. Um, obviously, some industries are struggling and there's been you know, payment off, uh, holidays offered and things like that. But on the main, um, most most of our customers are, are uh, managing to, to pull through, especially with all the, the, uh, the financial support and things that has been made available to them. That's good to hear. And if 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 you know if someone is needing to upgrade their hardware and the you know the obvious benefits of leasing, cash flow, etc., is appealing to them, is it is it easy enough for people to get get leases? Is there any uh, extra challenges with getting approvals and things like that at the moment? Yeah, you know, it's not just the commitment from the customer side, the commitment from the, the lease company side is there. Um, however, that's easing as well. So ask me that question in April and uh, I would have had to get lots more information from you. Um, now we're heading yeah. into July, August. The lease companies have uh, kind of almost gone back to where we were uh, pre-COVID. They are asking for a COVID-19 statement. So a couple of sentences to say how COVID has impacted you and what the recovery is looking like. Okay. Um, and we're asking for bank statements a little bit more than we used to before. Um, but it, it, again, you know, nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary. Um, and as with all companies, they're all just trying to trying to do their best and, and, and get back after this, uh, this interesting, troubling times. Absolutely. Well, no, it's good to know that, you know, you're there to help out and, and that, that all these things are possible. We'll, um, we'll make sure we put a link on the screen for everyone to come and Lovely. find you. And, uh, um, yeah, you know, thanks for coming by and saying hello. And we'll hope to see you at the show soon. Okay. Thanks for having us. Now on to Manage and Monitor News. Uh, with Small HD announcing a new entry into the reference grade monitor space, the OLED 22 4K production monitor. This new unit claims to be setting a new standard for color purists. It certainly is a stunning 4K reference monitor and boasts many of the advanced features that OLED users demand. The hardware design is built around the small 4K video processing architecture, offering eight 12 gig SDI and two HDMI 2.0 ports, all of which enable 4K signal processing. And now it's time to welcome our next guest into the studio. We've got Stephen Brownskill from TSL Products. Welcome to Kit Plus TV, Stephen. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we read in the news that all mobile video have purchased a large quantity of the new MPA1 Mixed Dante V units. Can you tell us a little bit more about this, please? Yeah, sure. So um, all mobile video have been customers of TSL for a number of years, um, and they shared with us that they were embarking on a new exciting project to build their first IP truck. And TSL have been manufacturing Dante products for a number of years. And uh, we had a new product in development specifically for outside broadcast. So everything fell into place quite nicely. So Stephen, what are the specific considerations that broadcasters need to take into account now when exploring audio over IP technologies? Well, of course, there are a great number of, of things to consider, but um, one of the key ones is whether you intend to adopt a, essentially a proprietary format. So there are uh, several proprietary systems out there, such as Dante, and Ravenna, and Livewire before that, um, or whether you want to go for an audio over IP solution that is standards-based. And so... We see that all mobile video have also ordered uh, more of the uh, pattern IP units. What's the response uh, otherwise been to uh, the PAM IP units now that ST2110 has been ratified for, for quite some time? Yeah, the, the PAM IP has been a very successful product for us. So um, as well as supporting Dante, um, the PAM IP supports the full 2110 stack, also uh, simply 2022-6. So for an audio monitor, you can monitor both your audio and your video content from a, from a single position. 
Cool. I've seen also, um, Stephen, I mean, I'm, I'm a video guy and I've always been told that I need to know audio. I've seen you're saying audio guys need to know about control. Uh, what exactly are you meaning by this? Yeah, so I think um, certainly uh, from TSL's perspective, you know, we, we have the luxury for a number of years of being able to produce a range of audio monitors without having to worry about control at all. Uh, but certainly in the, in the transition to IP, uh, that, that luxury no longer exists. So uh, as a customer, if I'm buying um, an audio unit from manufacturer A and an audio device from manufacturer B, um, then they may well both support SMPTE 2110 or they may well both support AES67. But, um, you know, so there's a high level of interoperability there. But really the, the, the gotcha is in the fine print, which is how can I have device B use the audio that is being generated by device A? Because these, these devices are connected across a network. So how do I do that? How, could, how do I control that? Mm, cool. So just before we uh, we say goodbye, Stephen, is there anything else in the pipeline? Um, obviously, leading up to IBC, which obviously isn't going to happen this year, is there anything that we can expect to hear from TSL shortly? Um, yeah, so um, we're continuing. Um, our roadmap is very much uh, centered around IP. Um, we have a new um, audio platform in development, um, and we have um, at least uh, five products uh, that I'm very excited to be able to uh, bring to market. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, with the COVID, um, that's that's put pay to NAB and IBC this year. Uh, but we're very much looking forward to meeting our customers at NAB next year to reveal those new products. Yeah, fingers crossed there, and we'll look forward to uh, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing what you've got uh, in the near future. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us on Kit Plus TV. Thank you. And our final workflow section is Move and Deliver with Vnova and NetInt Technologies announcing a collaborative roadmap that accelerates Vnova LCEVC's market deployment while further improving the performance of NetInt's encoding technology. NetInt Technologies launched the Codensity T408 video transcoder platform featuring real-time high-quality scalable H.264, H.265 ASIC based transcoding for live video streaming at up to 8K. For more information on the LCEVC codec, then watch the interview we did with Fabio from Vinova recently. You can find that at kitplus.com forward slash week eight. And even more news from Blackmagic Design. Do they ever stop? Another new release is the ATEM Streaming Bridge, a new converter that decodes the live stream from any ATEM Mini Pro model switcher and converts it back to SDI and HDMI video. The advantage of ATEM Streaming Bridge is that broadcasters can use it to connect high quality video links direct from any ATEM Mini Pro Studio, allowing them access to a wide range of talent worldwide. Yes, and obviously the quality is going to be a lot higher than normal, simple um, conferencing software, so you should get yes. clean broadcast quality video. Mm. Anyway, now it's time for our final workflow guest this week, and we'd like to welcome Richard Mansfield, who is Director of Streaming and Delivery at MediaKind. Uh, welcome to the show, Richard. Um, first start, tell us a little bit about MediaKind and what you guys are currently doing in the streaming market. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so MediaKind, for, for those of you that, that don't know us, we're a, a global leader. Uh, in providing media processing, delivery, and, and TV platform uh, software and solutions for broadcasters, satellite operators, telcos, cable providers, and OTT streaming as well. Um, I think you know we we kind of have our portfolio divided up into three key areas. Um, so we have uh, a third of it on the contribution and distribution side. Um, the third, which, which which I represent, on the consumer delivery side. Um, and then a third on the consumer experience and, uh, and really the, the front end of, of media as well. So is, is, that, is that where the, the launch of a killer streaming on the Google Cloud platform comes in? And, and, and you know, give us a little bit of a rundown of how that is going to help your customers. 
Sh sure thing. So uh, Aquila Streaming um, is part uh, of our head end portfolio. So uh, really focused on uh, encoding, packaging for streaming, um, and providing a, a streaming solution. Um, so traditionally, we, we've had that solution available um, as appliances uh, or as a software native portfolio. Um, but increasingly, we've been uh, seeing the trend for uh, a move towards SaaS-based and, and cloud operations, and that's really opening up some some new possibilities. Um, so, taking those uh, the kind of new entrants to the market for streaming and enabling uh, services such as pop-up channels or or short-term streaming use from uh, fr from a cloud environment. Um, or, or things, you know, more traditional uh, hybrid approaches where we have disaster recovery or other scenarios that can be handled uh, using a combination of on-prem um, and cloud-based services. Um, so for us, you know, we, we've had our software portfolio evolving to support those, those three different models, you know, be it an appliance, be it software, um, or be it a, a SaaS model. Um, and what we've done is taken our streaming head end and, and made that available um, on uh, Google Pla Cloud and using the Google Cloud infrastructure and technology so that we can obviously reach then a uh, global streaming audience from, from that, you know, either for those, uh, for our traditional install base um, or for the kind of the new direct-to-consumer market as well. Cool. Is um, there something that particularly... Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. I was wondering whether there was something particularly... Uh, that differentiates you from, uh, uh, you know, other service providers, whether it be in the type of content you deliver or how you deliver it. What, what's your, you know, what makes you unique? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I think from from our side, um, you know, we're really uh, focusing on a, a premium broadcast-like experience. So we're looking at the um, the evolving trend towards OTT delivery being more a, a main screen in-home experience with, with operators and service providers uh, actually using ABR delivery uh, to either augment broadcast or to, uh, in some in some cases, deliver all the way to the consumer using ABR delivery. So that means uh, being able to address a real broadcast-like experience um, when delivered using OTT technology. So uh, low latency, very high picture quality, being able to deal with um, you know, an increase in 4K, UHD, HDR content, um, and having that available on the streaming service as well. So you know, very much, uh, very much focusing on uh, the broadcast experience, but also con converging that with traditional broadcast methods as well. So you know, as I mentioned earlier on, MediaKind, we're, you know, we're also a, a, a supplier to the broadcast space. So we, you know, we, we have multiplexes, stat you know, those types of scenarios. Um, and our Aquila portfolio can then address that trend for, for broadcast, but also for OTT and streaming um, when supplied to, uh, you know, to those end users. So Richard, you mentioned evolving trends there, and we, we've heard from other guests on the show that technology has evolved, you know, that would normally take two years to evolve, has actually really evolved in two months over the current global situation. Is that, um, is that a trend that you've seen at MediaKind? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's one of the reasons that, um, as a service and uh, cloud cloud-based uh, offerings are kind of really starting to take hold. It's not just about how quickly it evolves, but also how quickly you can deploy it and get it on air, um, and being able to to move to you know, shared infrastructure and have that maybe as a, a first step to be able to bring bring channels on air very quickly. Um, either in addition to you know, more traditional uh, encoding and, and delivery chain. Um, or even potentially as a replacement. That's something we are seeing uh, as, a, as a trend as well, in that um, you know, there's more requests on that side, you know, being able to require less equipment on site, being, you know, being able to ramp these services up very quickly. And I think that time to market is, is something else that's uh, you know, very much being pushed on in the industry at the moment. Yeah, I love the term shared infrastructure, very relevant to how we produce the uh, Kit Plus TV show. Um, Richard, thank you very much for coming on Kit Plus TV. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you in person soon. Fantastic. Thanks all. Next up, it's time for Alistair Chapman's latest tech talk. Over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Simon. So I'm going to be a little bit controversial today and look at the full frame look. Is it real? 
or are we having the wool pulled over our eyes a little bit? We have a lot of camera manufacturers right now all pushing their latest full frame cameras as it being the latest and greatest thing that will transform the way you shoot, transform the way your images look. But how many of these claims are actually true and correct? One thing you hear all the time is people saying, I love the full frame look. But what exactly is the full frame look? For a very long time, people have been using cameras that have a super 35 millimeter sensor and adding an adapter on it to use full frame lenses so they get the same field of view on their super 35 camera as that full frame lens would produce on a full frame camera. So is this a different look? If I put that full frame lens on a full frame camera, does it somehow look different to putting the full frame lens with the adapter on a super 35 millimeter camera? Well, the reality is actually no, there is no difference. Well, rewind, hold up a minute. There might be a difference because it depends on the adapter. So the adapter is going to introduce some optical distortions into the image that aren't there with just the lens. So the lens plus adapter on a Super 35 camera will look a little bit different to the lens on a full frame camera. In reality, the full frame look is simply down to the optical qualities of the lens that you're using. And the one thing a large sensor does give you is the ability to get a wider field of view for any given focal length. And the add-on or roll-on effect from that is that the depth of field, because you're using a longer focal length to get the wider field of view, will be shallower for that field of view at any given aperture. So that may be a benefit. You may be able to achieve a wider field of view with a shallower depth of field, but that's simply because you're using a longer focal length. If we look at when you use an adapter to use a full frame lens on a super 35 millimeter camera, typically they're called a speed booster. One of the things that you also gain is that effectively, because of the way the lens compresses the image, making it smaller and thus brighter, the lens becomes around one stop faster. So that same lens again in Super 35 via an adapter gives you the same field of view and the same depth of field as it would do directly on the full frame sensor. So you have to think very carefully about this whole full frame look thing because there isn't actually such a thing as a full frame look. It's not something unique. You can get very similar looks at any size of sensor. It all really comes down to the quality of the lenses that you're using. And generally lenses made for full frame tend to be very high quality. So they tend to produce nice looking pictures. But there's no reason why you can't achieve a very similar look or almost identical look in most cases on a Super 35 sensor. Now the one thing that having a bigger sensor does definitely bring you is for any given resolution, you can have bigger pixels. And that allows you to have greater sensitivity and bigger dynamic range. And that's part of the reason why the camera manufacturers are pushing for bigger sensors because of those reasons. But for a look, no, there's no such thing as the full frame look. Next time, much less controversial, I'm going to look at ACEs and color managed workflows. What are they and why do you need to know about them? And with that, back to the studio. Thanks, Alistair. And as we said at the start of the show, Alistair has so far covered RAW, explained all we need to know about gamma curves, shown us how to select a tripod, weighed up ISO versus gain control, and shared his lockdown experiences with streaming. You can watch all of these on the previous weekly shows. The playlist link is on screen now. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the show, and we'll see you virtually next Tuesday with more workflow guests. Dick's interview, industry news, and technical insight from Alistair.